I'm very happy to be here to celebrate uh, Thibault. Uh, so this is a brief outline of my presentation. So I will start discussing uh, or reviewing briefly my adventures in gravitation at AGS during the time I was a postdoc here. I will um, discuss the original motivation to develop uh, the effective one body formalism uh, and then the path uh, for several years uh, to produce, to build a uh, UB waveform that could be used for searches and also to infer for studies, uh, inference studies by LIGO and Virgo. And in the second part or last part of my presentation, I will uh, highlight uh, how these waveforms have been used, the uh, signs that they have enabled, uh, in particular focusing on uh, the latest observing run by LIGO and Virgo. So I came here at HS in 1997, in September, after spending um, eight, nine months at CERN. And uh, at the time, I was actually working in cosmology of the early universe. And in fact, I spent the first, you cannot see that, the first uh, months or so uh, finishing a paper with collaborators, uh, Gabriele Veneziano, who I think is not here, at least uh, locally, but he might be connected. And uh, what was also very important to me uh, was that I attended in November 1997 a conference uh, on gravitational wave data analysis in Orsay. Actually, Thibault suggested me to attend the conference, which was really an aha moment for me because it was my first exposure to a gravitational wave from binary systems. There were many people at the conference. Some of them actually were even uh, staying here at AHES, Kip Thorne, Bernard Schutz. Patrick Brady, Bruce Allen, and Satya Prakash. And uh, it played a really important role for me. But the first months at IHES uh, were spent actually working on something else with Thibault. We wrote uh, two papers on cosmic strings, radiation reaction in cosmic strings, from the emission of dilatonic, axionic, gravitational waves. And then uh, we also spent many months uh, that year working with Gabriele Veneziano, who was on sabbatical, I believe, here at IHES. Uh, working on the problem of initial conditions in uh, the Privy Bank model. Then it came the summer of 1998. I just actually went back to look at my notebooks. It was the first time in my notebook where I started having some discussion with Tivo about uh, gravitational wave from binary systems. Now, that was the time in which LIGO facility was almost completed. Uh, in fact, in 1999, between 1999 and 2002, there was the commissioning, and then the first data were taken in 2002. Virgo was under construction still, and um, I was told at the time, uh, I think mainly by Tivo, that uh, if black holes with uh, masses, a few tens of solar masses, existed in binaries, they would be the strongest sources of gravitational waves. And the reason was just because they would coalesce uh, in the detector sweet spot around a few hundred hertz. So, of course, in order to detect these systems and also, you know, interpret them pr properly, uh, we needed uh, templates, and in particular, the merger signal was crucial. And at the time, despite the effort of many years uh, work in numerical relativity, there was no merger signal yet, uh, no numerical relativity simulation. And in fact, at the time, Kip Thorne was uh, um, showing in many of his talks um, a plot like this, uh, saying that we need numerical relativity simulations and the merger signal could be quite complicated. On the numerical side, as uh, Luke was showing before, at the time, the binding energy and the gravitational wave energy flux were only known at very low order, 2pn and 2.5 post-Newtonian order. And these are the crucial ingredient because to get uh, the gravitational wave frequency and the phase, you need to solve the balance equation. So you need to know these two ingredients here. And just to show you in a plot, uh, as a function of the uh, velocity with respect to the speed of light, uh, this was the 1pn result and the 2pn result at the time. And I added just the most recent result in the last 10 years. And this was the flux. And you can see disagreements in the region of velocities where we expect actually uh, black hole systems uh, to merge. I'm sorry that uh, the plot doesn't show very well here. Okay, so then uh, after starting, uh, as I said, in the summer of 1998, uh, in November 1998, we put out uh, the first paper uh, where we uh, looked at the conservative part of the dynamics and we mapped the two-body description in a one-body one with a particular mapping of the energy. Uh, we'll go into, into the details of this in a few slides. 
And then uh, we wanted to focus on the uh, waveform. Uh, and at the same time, in um, 1999, I actually moved to Caltech with a fellowship in the group of Kip Thorne. So we finished the paper when I was there. And this was the paper of the transition from Inspiral to Plunge, with also the, um, the waveform, including uh, uh, the merger and the ring down. OK, so now let me uh, describe a little bit more the details and, uh, uh, of all this uh, framework. So th the main idea was that uh, in a post-Newtonian expansion, you expand everything. The Hamiltonian, for example, is post-Newtonian expanded, including also the probe limit, the test body limit, where, on the other hand, we know the solution. We know exactly the solution, Schwarzschild and Kerr. And so the idea was uh, to not expand the, the uh, test body limit, but keep it uh, uh, exact. And, uh, and then uh, map the dynamics in the dynamics of uh, a Schwarzschild or Kerr uh, black hole deformed, where the deformation parameter was the finite mass ratio, uh, this parameter nu. Uh, some of the ideas of this approach were inspired by uh, quantum field theory um, when describing the binding energy of comparable mass charge bodies. So we came up with uh, doing, uh, working in a coordinate invariant manner with the Hamilton-Jacobi formalism, uh, with this map of the, of the energy, the effective energy and the real energy. Um, which was very close, actually, I mean, was actually mapping to uh, similar results obtained uh, in the 17s by Brezen, Hitchison, and Zenjustan for the positronium. And if you look at uh, scattering states, uh, this actually expression here of the effective energy can be related to the Mandelson variable S, and is basically this symmetric function of the asymptotic momenta, which reduces in the test mass limit to the energy of the uh, mass M2 in the rest frame of M1. OK, so we thought we had a better Hamiltonian. So just to recap, so one starts from the Hamiltonian expanded. Uh, the work with Thibault in 1998 was a 2 pn order. So uh, this was the effective Hamiltonian with uh, the potential here deformed uh, with uh, dependence on nu now. Uh, this was then uh, the new Hamiltonian that was resum, uh, having uh, the exact probe limit incorporated. And now uh, all the dynamics is condensed on these two coefficients here. And for circular orbits, it's the actually the A coefficient that plays the most important role. So this was the 2pn result, 3pn, the work by Damuri and Anoske Schaeffer, and then later 4pn, 5pn is unknown today. OK, so now one has uh, better, hopefully, uh, Hamiltonia to describe the conservative part of the dynamics. Then one can write uh, the Hamilton equation with this Hamiltonian, and we needed to have uh, uh, the radiation reaction force. And uh, in the first paper, this was resummed à la Pade uh, from work that Thibault have done with uh, Satya Prakash and, uh, and uh, Bala Ayer. And, um, and then one from the waveform, one can compute the waveform on the trajectory. And, uh, and this was the waveform during the inspire and the late inspire, as you can see here. This is the evolution of the gravitational wave frequency, uh, which is twice the orbital frequency. And then at the end, once the two black hole form, uh, uh, merge, sorry, uh, a new black hole form, the black hole is uh, ringing with quasi-normal modes. So how do we complete uh, uh, the waveform? Well, that came some ideas from the 70s, uh, papers, uh, including actually a paper here from uh, Remo Ruffini of 72, were pointing out that the quasi-normal modes are excited uh, at the light ring crossing, if you were studying the case of a small body plunging into a black hole. And so what we did uh, was to just uh, add a superposition of quasi-normal modes um, uh, and complete the waveform and do this very quick you know, transition uh, up to the final uh, uh, frequency of the, of the black hole ring in the least damp quasi-normal mode. Now, of course, at the time, there was no numerical relativity. So we didn't know, given the masses of the inspire, what would be the final mass and the final spin of the black hole. So that we guessed. Um, we took the, by the energy at the light ring and the angular momentum at the light ring, and we computed uh, um, basically the mass and the spin. And actually, this value is 10% off of what then numerical relativity predicted a few years later. 
Okay, so I want actually to uh, emphasize again this uh, simplicity of the merger waveform, going back to the test mass limit, uh, because I think this was very crucial to then uh, uh, build this model, extend it to spin, and then you know, use result from numerical relativity later on. So if you go in the test body limit, uh, and you look at the perturbation, the gravitational perturbation, you have the reggio wheeler zeril equation that I wrote here. This is a potential. The potential actually peaks at the light ring. So again, the idea followed was that, OK, there is this uh, potential which peaks at the light ring. If now you consider a body that spirals in and plunges and goes into the black hole, um, until the moment the, the, um, uh, as the body uh, goes into the black hole, uh, emits gravitational radiation from the quadrupole formula. But once uh, it is inside the potential, then the direct uh, radiation is basically filtered by the barrier. And the only thing that you can see is basically these spacetime vibrations uh, which leak out from the potential, which we are just representing as a superposition of quasi-normal modes. Uh, actually assuming that uh, the linear approximation really, really works uh, starting from merger, basically. OK, so then in 2005, there was the black breakthrough of uh, numerical relativity with Prans Pretorius first. This is the famous uh, figure from his paper. And then um, in uh, November 2005, uh, the group at NASA Goddard and uh, the group of Campanelli and Lusto also got for the first time uh, the um, uh, result of for the merger. And now there is another conference uh, which played an important role for me because at the time, this is the result of Baker and Campanelli was presented at this conference in uh, November 2005. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had moved back to uh, CNRS, but uh, I was back actually in Maryland um, in, uh, at that time. I was invited at the conference. And at the conference, I talk about this other paper, which I think is my last paper with Thibaut, uh, except for some other papers with other many more collaborators, uh, NRAR collaboration, etc. So this was a paper that uh, I did uh, while I was at the IAP uh, with uh, Thibaut and uh, Yan Wei Chen, where we extended the UB for the first time to spin effects, although you know not, more, uh, not uh, so accurate as we have it today, but still spin effects, even precessing. And we produce the first waveforms uh, with precession and spin effects, which are shown here, non-spinning, uh, generic up and down means uh, spin 50% of the maximum value, a little bit misaligned with the angular momentum. And in this paper, we also had uh, a plot showing the signal-to-noise ratio at 100 megaparsec uh, for different value of the spin of the binary uh, as a function of the total mass of the binary for initial LIGO. Uh, and you can see again uh, that uh, the ma majority of the contribution uh, in the SNR comes from uh, large black hole systems. Okay, so then I uh, started at that point, that conference, as I said, was very important to me because I met uh, Franz Petorius and Greg Cook, and I was very eager to compare the results of the UB uh, formalism. So these were two uh, uh, figures taken from uh, the paper uh, with uh, Franz, uh, his first simulation of the two black holes uh, merging. This is the distorted uh, uh, common apparent horizon. The plot I was showing you before of the frequency increasing and going to the quasi-normal mode is now shown here for the numerical simulation. This is the peak of the luminosity. This point is the light ring of the final black hole. 50% of the energy is just emitted in the last part. But you can see that the transition is very quick and is very rapid, although very energetic. So then, in this paper, uh, we compare with uh, uh, the UB formalism for the first time. In dashed is the UB for the spiral merger, is spiral plunge and then merger in down. So there are some differences. Uh, uh, because this is an analytical approximate model, but uh, you know, the main features are captured. And um, this model it's, has no information from numerical relativity. It was augmented because in the meantime, the 3 p.m. calculation was done, so was included the coefficients, and also at 3.5 p.m. there were the results for the flux. OK, so at that point, uh, um, started uh, uh, because the numerical relativity now became available, all this work uh, at the interface, collaborating with the numerical uh, relativity people. And uh, uh, I had close by the people at NASA, so I started uh, 
a collaboration with them, calibrating the EOBNR waveforms. You see here an example where now no, results from numerical relativity are incorporated. And this was the first model that was actually used in the first search for binary black hole by LIGO and Virgo, initial LIGO and Virgo. So we are before advanced LIGO here. Uh, and the data were taken in these two periods. Actually, this was only LIGO and here also Virgo joined. And there were two papers by the LIGO collaboration, no, no detection. This was uh, you know, before 2015, but upper limits were set on the merger event rates for binary black holes. OK, uh, ah, and I should emphasize this was work also done with uh, a great collaboration with the group of Satya Prakash in Cardiff. OK, so at that point, uh, uh, given the result from numerical relativity, we really needed to improve even more the model, the spin sector. And here I want to emphasize a couple of things. Uh, so when you do the mapping of the two spins, uh, with, uh, two bodies with mass and spin, uh, you have also some more freedom uh, where you put the spins uh, to the central object, to the test mass. And uh, I want to show you uh, two uh, uh, paths. Uh, so, first of all, if you go to the Kerr case, uh, you can consider a test spin in Kerr spacetime. And this was what we followed and developed uh, when I was at Maryland with Enrico Barose. Um, and uh, on the other hand, starting from the paper by Thibault, and then followed by, as so you, uh, you will see in a moment, uh, by collaborators. And uh, uh, you can also consider still a test mass uh, in Kerr. So uh, you can introduce the spin effect in other ways with the gyro magnetic uh, functions. In fact, when you go from Kerr to the comparable mass case, uh, then just symbolically, uh, you have two possible you know, Hamiltonians. So one uh, that was developed by my group in, uh, at Maryland and then in Germany, SUBNR, and TUBRSMS, as I said, started from Thibault and then uh, the work by Thibault, Piotr, and uh, um, uh, Gerard Schaeffer, and then Alessandro Naga, many more papers and collaborators. OK, uh, the other crucial thing, important thing, um, was the improvement of the radiation reaction. In the first papers, uh, we use uh, the, uh, the radiation force, the radiation reaction force expressed in terms of the flux, and we sum and then it came this paper by uh, Thibault and Balayer and Alessandro Naga, where they suggested to rewrite the, uh, the force in terms of uh, the modes, Lm, and they had uh, uh, a resummation of the modes in factorized form inspired again by result in the test body limit. OK, so now I want to uh, um, move more on um, uh, work closer to um, uh, advanced LIGO and, uh, and then the discovery and all the work at, uh, on the inference, uh, in inference studies. So we needed also to improve uh, all the process of calibrating this waveform. And I want uh, just to uh, uh, show with this plot the fact how do we do that. So we start from a model which is not calibrated. Uh, and uh, uh, if you compare with numerical relativity, there is some difference after, let's say, 60 gravitational wave cycles. Uh, then we include uh, post-Newtonian corrections in the model, which are unknown today. And we uh, basically uh, fit them or extract them from the numerical relativity results, and we get a better agreement. And then because the models are originally built for quasi-circular orbit, and the last part, uh, when the two body plunge, the motion becomes um, uh, go beyond uh, quasi-circularity, then we correct with these some called uh, non-quasi-circular corrections, which are again uh, inferred from the numerical results. Uh, now, for what concern the work that uh, um, uh, I've been involved, which is uh, the SUBNR, uh, we built uh, the templates uh, that uh, were used in the first, second, and third observing run of the LIGO and Virgo collaboration, working closely with the simulating extreme space-time collaboration. So this is an example where this, what I explained on the left, uh, is repeated uh, in the parameter space of the mass ratio and the combination of the spin of the binary for different points, also using results from the Tiokoski code. And then you extrapolate the model everywhere else, uh, and you validate it uh, with some numerical relativity simulation that were not used for the calibration. Uh, similar work has been done also for the TOB resum S. 
so the template bank that LIGO and Virgo has been using starting from the first run in 2015 is uh, illustrated here. This is the projection in the masses M1, M2 of the binary. There are also the direction of the spins for masses larger than three solar masses of the order of 300,000 uh, SUBNR templates have been used for the search. For lower masses, plain post Newtonian uh, templates can be used because the signal to noise ratio in the merger is basically negligible. So one uses just in spiral uh, waveforms uh, from uh, post Newtonian theory. Uh, okay. Because I will show you now some highlights of the signs uh, with uh, the LIGO and Virgo detectors, I have to introduce very briefly other two waveform models because you will see some plots with them. One is called uh, Inspire Merger in Down Phenomenologica. Uh, it's built completely in the frequency domain in closed form. It's quite fast because it's a uh, frequency domain. And it's built by hybridizing in time domain an effective one body waveform at low frequency and an R, fre uh, an R waveform at high frequency. Um, and the other one, uh, which is quite more recent, uh, is to do directly an interpolation of the numerical relativity waveform, because today we have more than we had many years ago. And this is called the NR surrogate. However, although this is a very accurate model, it is uh, confined to the region in which we know numerical relativity simulations. They are very time consuming to produce, and typically they are only of the order of 20 orbits, which means uh, you can only use them when the total mass of the binary is quite large. OK, so conclusion, you cannot see this plot. <laughs> Uh, we have many uh, extensions of the models, including array harmonics, uh, precession, parameterized form uh, to include deviation from, uh, numerical, from general relativity, eccentricity, etc., also in the other you know, uh, template families. But let me start uh, now with uh, uh, the comparison, with the use uh, with the LIGO and Virgo. So these waveforms were used, as I said, in a template bank and also to for inference study for the first detection that you see on the left. Since then, LIGO and Virgo have discovered 55 binary black holes represented in this uh, plot here. This is the mass in solar masses, uh, including two binary neutron star and two neutron star black holes uh, that uh, the paper just came out uh, last uh, uh, June. Uh, so let me start on the left. Uh, you see a visualization of uh, this event, uh, 1908-14. Um, actually, it's not a numerical relativity simulation. It would be too long to produce. Uh, it's actually an EOBNR waveform, which uh, got a visualization. And uh, now, this event, why it was puzzling? It was puzzling because uh, uh, the secondary mass is actually between a neutron star and a black hole, okay? as the mass between a neutron star and a black hole. And because of the asymmetry in the masses, uh, the signal is quite rich. What you see here, uh, going from four seconds before merger, you can still see the higher mode, for example, the L equal 4, M equal 4, and one second before merger, the L equal 5, M equal 5. Maybe you can see it better here, which is just the last part of the evolution. So in order to identify properly this event, uh, and in particular to nail down the mass of the secondary, we really needed to have very accurate waveforms that include uh, higher harmonics and precession. And what you see in this plot, uh, which is the posterior distribution for the secondary mass, uh, is the comparison with the two waveform model EOBNR and Phenom. And uh, you can see that the posterior become quite tight if you include higher harmonics and precession. And again, let me emphasize, it was very important for this event uh, to understand the mass of the secondary, because there is this puzzle, puzzle, is it a black hole or a neutron star? The other example I wanted to give uh, is 1905-21. This is so a simulation now, a numerical simulation produced by Neil Fisher uh, in, uh, in my group. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you can see the very large masses. It's a very short signal. Unfortunately, you cannot see this plot if you are in this room. Uh, these are the plots of the masses and the projection of the spin on the um, orbital plane here, and uh, sorry, on the orbital plane here and along the direction perpendicular to the orbital plane on the right. And you can see that now also the NR surrogate uh, is included because this was such a high mass system that the method that interpreted the numerical relativity simulation uh, could be used because the waveform was quite short. 
Anyway, until now, we are not dominated by systematics, uh, uh, even if there are differences between the models. Uh, we are dominated by the statistical uncertainty, which is set by the signal to noise ratio in the detector. OK, so let me now say a few words about the fact that um, uh, until now, until if, uh, maybe a year ago, all the waveforms that have been uh, used by LIGO and Virgo didn't include eccentricity because the most promising sources were supposed to be quasi-circular. Uh, but as we go to more sensitive detectors in the next few years, starting from next run, next uh, August, uh, it will be very important to include eccentricity. So I want to show you just uh, an extension of the model that we did recently um, with the spins uh, that are not precising, aligned, but uh, including also the higher harmonics. This is the comparison with numerical relativity. I wonder if you can see this plot here, uh, with eccentricity 0.06. Uh, you can also produce with a model a, a larger eccentricity, uh, 0 0.8, for example, uh, in red. This is an example of the dynamical capture. And uh, there have been also other uh, work in the literature, and uh, I think uh, Sebastiano will show something later in the afternoon. OK, now I want to say a few words about the extension to matter, binary neutron stars. How much time I have? Eh? Four more minutes at 30, so you are over with time. Uh, okay. But you can speak. I can speak. Uh, yeah, okay. Another couple of minutes. Uh, that's another couple of minutes. Okay, so I then I go very, very fast. So I just wanted to say, Sebastiano will talk also about this, so I don't have. Uh, I want just to emphasize the fact that, of course, uh, we want to understand uh, uh, the equation of state of neutron star in the, in the core. And uh, the here there is, as Luke was saying, a new parameter, which is zero for black holes, uh, which is the tidal deformability parameter. So we have extended uh, uh, the EOBNR uh, waveform model to uh, tidal effects uh, in this paper uh, with Tanya and uh, Jan. Um, with uh, tidal effects, the potential uh, gets uh, another term and becomes attra more attractive. In our group, uh, we have focused actually on the description of dynamical tides instead of adiabatic tides, in the sense that we have included the possibility that because um, of, of the F mode in the neutron star, uh, um, the tidal force, uh, if you go in the frequency domain, could excite, could have a frequency that could uh, excite actually the uh, F mode of the neutron star. Uh, so this is just uh, um, uh, shows actually this effect of the tidal deformability depending on uh, time or frequency. And uh, uh, also here, all the work to compare to numerical relativity has been uh, uh, done. Uh, and uh, these waveforms uh, have been used uh, for the inference of properties uh, with the two binary neutron stars uh, that have been detected by LIGO and Virgo. So the last thing I wanted to say is about the neutron star black holes. Also here with uh, Andrew Matas, we have extended the model to neutron star black holes. You can see here the comparison of, uh, of the model with a binary black hole. Um, and because of the tidal disruption, uh, there is a difference uh, at the very end. And this uh, neutron star uh, uh, black hole family was in particular used uh, for the detection, for um, uh, understanding the tidal effects in the neutron star black hole that was actually detected by LIGO. Uh, this is a visualization by Tim Dietrich, uh, sorry, the simulation by Tim Dietrich uh, for the second event here. And because of the masses and the spin of the black hole, uh, not much of a disk is formed. The, black hole, the neutron star is swallowed all, as you can see here in the animation. And uh, again, uh, the waveforms were used uh, uh, by the LIGO and Vigo collaboration to extract the masses uh, for this event. OK, uh, I will not show the uh, test of general relativity. You can ask me. <laughs> yeah, okay. And uh, I just go to the end. Um, OK, this is just a summary. So I hope I convinced you that uh, to make precise prediction of the two-body dynamics and gravitational radiation has been crucial to observe uh, and uh, learn and uh, identify events uh, with LIGO and Virgo. The work with uh, uh, numerical relativity has been also very important. I didn't talk about many things about uh, the effective one body formalism, but I hope people will uh, discuss this uh, here during the week. Uh, bright future of this field uh, in the next few years with LIGO and Virgo, but also the next decades on the ground and uh, in space. We need to continue to improve uh, 
the waveform models uh, because uh, um, of the larger sensitivity that uh, the detector will have uh, in, uh, in the future. I want to thank my group on which many things have been uh, based uh, for this presentation. And finally, I want really to thank Thibault. I had a wonderful adventure here at HS 23, 24 years ago. <laughs> and I really want to thank you because uh, you really raised my interest uh, in the subject of gravitational waves from binary system and also for many fruitful and enjoyable discussion I had with you since then. Okay, thank you Alessandro.